Good morning. You may be seated. Good morning. <laughs> Members of the class of 2018, faculty and staff, distinguished guests, families, friends of the university, welcome to the 163rd commencement for the Washington and Lee School of Law. We gather this morning to celebrate the achievements of our graduates and to share their excitement about the future that awaits them. This ceremony marks the beginning of a new chapter in the life of each graduate, but just as surely it marks the ending of another. You've spent three years together in this beautiful place. It has shaped you as individuals and as a class. Together you've studied, argued, and developed the habits of mind that characterize good lawyers. You made lasting friendships that will give you pleasure and support you wherever you may go. Before you go to travel your different paths, it's important this morning to savor your final moments together here on this historic campus that has been your shared home. You're seated in front of Washington Hall, named for our most famous benefactor, whose gift to Liberty Hall Academy enabled its transformation into the college that would come to bear his name. George Washington saw that the future of the United States lay to the West, and he believed there needed to be quality education on the frontier. The frontier was the Blue Ridge Mountains, and Washington College became the first institution of higher learning on the western side of those ancient hills. Even George Washington was not so foresighted, however, as to be able to imagine higher education on the other side of the ravine. That was a joke. <laughs> It took another 180 years before Washington and Lee University, with the opening of Lewis Hall in 18, 1977, dared to educate its students on the frontier of the frontier. But horizons shift over time, and just as Appalachia is no longer the edge of America, Lewis Hall is no longer the edge of our campus. The School of Law is once again geographically central, as it should be, in keeping with the historical and contemporary importance to the university. For most of its long history, the law school was located on this side of the ravine. If you glance over your left shoulder, you will see Tucker Hall, which was home to our law students and faculty from 1936 to 1976. Last summer, it was restored to its former glory, and you can once again, and I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity, enjoy the two-story law library in which one Supreme Court justice and several American Bar Association presidents along with many other distinguished alumni, received their legal education. I hope that during your time at Washington and Lee, each of you has had occasion to take a long, leisurely walk along the colonnade. I make that walk every day on my way to work. It's a tough commute. And I'm inspired to reflect upon the words of our late art history professor, Pamela Simpson, who wrote, when we think of our most deeply held values, academic excellence, collegiality, civility, and most of all, honor. All of them are embodied here. White columns, worn steps, halls hallowed by time, and the strength embodied within them. Those values are eternal, common to all who pass through WNL, and they guide us as we meet the particular demands of each year. This year, we've challenged ourselves to determine how we can teach and present the history of the university as comprehensively and accurately as possible. We've also undertaken strategic planning. We've asked ourselves in conjunction with our motto, non in couches futuri, not unmindful of the future, how the university can become an even better version of itself. Law school students, faculty, and staff have played leading roles in these processes. And both the law school and the university will be stronger for it as we commit to deepening the connections between undergraduate and legal education at WNL, to raising additional scholarship funds to support our law students, and to setting a national example for how complex histories should be explored. You, the class of 2018, have been here at an important time. I will remember you, and I know you will remember Washington and Lee, the place, the people, the lessons you have learned. Take Washington and Lee with you into the world and you and the world will be better for it. You're well prepared to practice a noble profession successfully and with honor. We congratulate you. We know that you will make us proud and we wish you the very best. I now call upon Dean Brant Helwig, who will lead us through the remainder of today's ceremony.
Thank you very much, President Dudley. What a fantastic day to be in this majestic setting on what turned out to be a beautiful Lexington morning. Let's hope that holds. Uh, to celebrate a significant milestone in the lives of our students, soon to be our graduates. It is a joy and privilege to be a part of it. One of my favorite aspects of commencement is the palpable sense of pride that permeates the entire ceremony. Justifiable pride that you have in your own accomplishments, pride that you have in the accomplishments of your classmates, and pride that your friends and family, many of whom are fortunate, uh, we are fortunate to have with us today, pride that they have in you. The members of the law school faculty, administration, and staff feel the same way. We are proud of you and we are fortunate to share in this joyous occasion. All right, to the class of 2018, I have just a few words, and the first one is congratulations. Congratulations on making it through three grinding years of study, through the first year of law school when everything was exciting, new, uh, at times terrifying, but also fun. Through the second year when you quickly assume veteran status, and at times noticed that the incoming class of first year students seemed to be just a little bit too eager. That second year when you became so overloaded with journals, moot court competitions, student groups, and job search activities that you couldn't believe that you ever actually thought you were busy before then. And through the third year when you started transitioning to the practice of law through your participation in immersion, clinics, externships, and practicum courses, when you stepped out of the classroom setting and started to test out your role as an advocate and counselor. Throughout your time here, you've had opportunities to push your individual limits, to discover skills you may not have known you had, and to develop your identity as a legal professional. It is no small feat to navigate the demands and pressures of law school, but you have. Nice work, congratulations on getting to this point. The second message I have for you is almost as straightforward. Thank you. Thank you for being a critical part of the WNL law community. There are several factors that make our law school unique, and when I'm asked what those are, the one I'm quick to highlight is the overall character of our student body. In addition to coming to law school with a mix of intellectual curiosity, professional ambition, and desire to affect the communities and society in which we live, our student body, and your class in particular, possesses a number of traits that have helped us shape the environment in Lewis Hall. Some descriptors that come to my mind. Genuine, good-humored, driven, supportive, and most of all, decent. You've made our law school not only intellectually enriching, but upbeat and fun. Thank you for contributing your individual personalities to the overall character of our law school. Thank you as well for the contribu contributions you've made to the intellectual life of our law school, for your probative questions in class, for your intriguing conversations in the halls and in our offices, for your dedicated work on student journals, for recruiting thoughtful and thought-provoking speakers to campus, for having the courage to push your limits in moot court and other advocacy competitions, and for representing us to external audiences in a manner that reflected well on you, on our law school, and on our university more broadly. On behalf of the faculty, thank you for letting us be a part of your development as a legal professional. We hope that we've contributed to your future professional and personal success, and I can say with certainty that our interactions with you over the past three years have been both personally and professionally rewarding for us. As a final matter, I'd like to highlight one aspect of the law school's mission statement. Uh, it begins as follows. The Washington and Lee University School of Law seeks to cultivate broad-minded, highly skilled and honorable practitioners of law. Let me pause for a minute to stress that last adjective, our goal for you to be honorable practitioners of law. Certainly honor is part of the central fabric of the law school and the university. But importantly, and I would say thankfully, it does not end when you leave Lewis Hall or when you receive your diploma in just a few minutes. Rather, that is really just the beginning. Regardless of the career path you pursue, conducting yourself in an honorable manner is pivotal to having an enjoyable and meaningful career. Honor certainly encompasses individual qualities such as integrity, honesty, and dependability. These attributes are central to the legal profession you are on the cusp of entering, 
And these values simply cannot yield in the face of pressures to zealously advance the interest of your client, or perhaps at an even more practical level, pressures to satisfy the demands of your boss. Your professional identity, based in large part on your internal code of ethical and professional conduct, that's an asset that you create. There are not many assets that we can create out, out of whole cloth, but that's one. And while maintaining high professional standards will lead to a more accomplished career over the long term, perhaps the greatest value flowing from your professional identity is subjective, measured in terms of the personal satisfaction you will take from pursuing your work, your craft, in a just manner. But there's a separate aspect of honor I'd like to highlight. While the concept of honor is in many ways inwardly focused, honor also has a relational quality to it. If we think about what makes for an honorable practitioner of law, it's hard to imagine achieving that characterization without regard to how one interacts with others. Regarding this relational aspect of honor, some attributes come to mind. Treating others with respect and dignity regardless of their station in the profession or in society more broadly. Being open to not only hearing, but actually considering opposing views. Having empathy for those who are less fortunate and recognizing that you are part of a collective larger than yourself and acting accordingly. These are all aspects of being an honorable professional that come to my mind and I'm sure you could come up with many more. But thankfully, these are attributes that we have seen on full display from members of your class over, the, over recent years. And I, um, and I simply encourage you to intentionally pursue them in your career going forward. These attributes help us promote a Washington and Lee Law School brand in the legal profession, a brand from which we all benefit, and a brand I hope and trust you will contribute to in the years ahead. So let me close where I started. Congratulations on all that you've accomplished, and best wishes to you as you start the next exciting chapter of your lives. We hope that your, edu your education and your overall experience here will serve you well, and we also hope that you will continue to be an integral part of the Washington and Lee Law School community going forward. Thank you very much. All right, now let's get to the highlight of the ceremony, the conferring of degrees. I now ask the members of the law class of 2018 to rise. All right. <laughs> President Dudley, I have the honor to present 114 candidates for the Juris Doctor degree. They've been examined by the faculty and approved by the Board of Trustees. They are to be congratulated on their command of the ways by which justice is attained and commended for their exceptional learning to the advancement of a just social order. I ask you by your official act to confer upon them their degrees. Upon the recommendation of the faculty and approval by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer the degree of Juris Doctor of Washington and Lee University. Please come forward to receive the diploma as your names are called. I ask that the audience hold its applause until the last graduate has received the diploma. Aileen Armas Almonte. Peter S. Askin. Caitlin J. Bates. Sean Michael Bennett. Chloe Jocelyn Billado. Thomas Edward Arthur Bishop. Dioscoro Andres Blanco. Mark Paul Bonin II.
Christopher Clayton Brewer. Timothy James Briggs, in absentia. Winston Watts Burks IV. Jessica Ann Campbell. Craig Allen Carrillo. Kelly Ann Chrisman. Jean Marie Christie. Amanda Cluse. Dowin Coffey. Taylor Welch Davison. Craig Samuel DeFrancisco. Mark John Duye. Matthew Christopher Donahue. Harrison Marshall Dorbeck. Bennett T.W. Esom. Natalie Ray Ecker. Stephen B. Edwards. Elizabeth M. Ellington. Joshua Sean Everard. John C. Fluerty. Gregory Terrence Funk. Richard W. Good the Fourth. Congratulations. Emily Ann Gorham. Harold Watson Gowdy the Fourth. <clears throat> Thomas W. Griffin the Third. Anthony C. Guntz the Fourth. J. Wan Ha. Jacqueline Noel Hacker. Alexandra Shinsei Hakasui. Roland Oliver Hartung. Luisa Maria Fernandez. Fiorella Sofia Herrera. John Sterling Hauser.
Christopher T. Hoynicki. Blake Kenneth Huddleston. Christopher Allen Hurley. Ian Burton Hewitt. Elizabeth Branch Jenkins. Colt Wesley Justice. Gabriel F. Callan. Joshua M. Kaplan. Isaac Koretz. Stephen C. Kinderman. Laura Lee Kleiner. Craig James Coling. Charu Kulkerni. Ross Lane LaFour. Sarah Elizabeth Lamnick. <laughs> Brett Lincoln Lawrence. <laughs> Alexander Lewitt. Corey Martin Lipschitz. Joseph Jensen Lockwood. Andrew Carlisle Logan. Christopher Charles Losito. Kendall P. Manning. Lauren Alexandra Martin. Morris E. McCrary the Fourth. Anna Ross Moyer. Kelsey Leanne Morgan. Aubrey J. Morin. Jonathan Andrew Murphy. Benjamin David Nadorf. Rachel Zoe Norby. Benjamin S. Nye. Elsa Maria Britt Oman. Congratulations. 
John Sills O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. That's great. That's awesome. Gabrielle Lena Ola Angayas. Jameson Ryan Pratt Parker. Daniel Lassane Phillips. Thomas Clayton Pittman. Javier F. Puga. Brian D. Quigley. Taylor Daniel Raffoli. Nicholas Alexander Ramos. <laughs> Ian Roberts. Maria Vittoria Rossi. Michaela Annalisa Samor. Tyler Jonathan Sanderson. Nicholas Andrew Schaefer. Elena Yuran Shao. Melinda Catherine Shield. Erica Lees Sieg. Alex Meyer Sirota. <laughs> Starley Smith. Thank you. Stephen Carroll Speck. Emily Marie Springer. Jonathan Craig Stanley. Ann Patterson Steele. <laughs> Carrie Lynn Steele. Anjali Jenna Tigan. Jacob E. Thayer, in absentia. Catherine Page Thomas. Peter Trutland Thomas. Meredith M. Toole. Mary Catherine Vaughn. Marta Goodwin Vasquez. Brian Cody Wagoner.
Nicole Grimes Waybright. Holly Nicole Webb. Devin C. White. Spencer Thomas Wiles. Glenn B. Williams. Danielle Elise Wise. Catherine Elizabeth Woodcock. Austin Grant Woodside. Mark X. Zhuang. It is now my distinct honor to introduce you to our commencement speaker, Professor David B. Wilkins. Professor Wilkins is the Lester Kissel Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, where he also serves as Vice Dean for Global Initiatives on the Legal Profession and Faculty Director of the Center on the Legal Profession and the Center for Lawyers and the Professional Services Industry. Additionally, Professor Wilkins is a Senior Research Fellow of the American Bar Foundation and a faculty associate at Harvard University Edmund J. Safra Foundation Center for Ethics. Professor Wilkins teaches several courses on lawyers, including the legal profession, legal education for the 21st century, and challenges of a general counsel. In 2007, he co-founded Harvard Law School's executive education program, where he teaches several courses, including leadership in law firms and leadership in corporate counsel. Professor Wilkins has written over 80 articles on the legal profession in leading scholarly journals and the popular press, and he is the co-author of one of the leading case books in the field. Uh, Professor Wilkins is Harvard through and through. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard College in 1977 and his law degree from Harvard Law School in 1980. He then joined the, the faculty at Harvard Law School in 1986. Uh, in between, Professor Wilkins served as law clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court, and he practiced law in the Civil Litigation Department of the Washington, D.C. firm of Nussbaum, Owen, and Webster, a firm which at the time included as a partner Earl Dudley, uh, President Dudley's father. And I should note that we're pleased to be joined by both of President Dudley's delightful parents, Earl and Louise, this morning. Professor Wilkins, it is an honor to have you join us today, and thank you for sharing your wisdom and expertise with our graduating students. So please join me in welcoming Professor David Wilkins. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dean Helwig. Um, so I'll try to stick around a little bit during lunch if anybody wants to know what he looked like in short pants as a teenager. I can tell you, you're president. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how happy it makes me uh, to be able to say, President Dudley, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation. Um, I also can't help but saying, you know, there's a certain uh, school some of you may know, which is uh, south of here, uh, where their fight song or their motto is, if God is an Atar Heel, why is the sky Carolina blue? You know that one? Okay. But here's the thing, given the weather forecast, 
God went to W and L, I think, for sure. Um, in any event, President Dudley, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, Dean Helwig, graduates, parents, and especially grandparents and friends, thank you for giving me the honor of being your graduation speaker today. You know, they call this day commencement, you know, which means obviously beginning. But when I was a student, I never got that because I wasn't thinking about the beginning today. I was thinking about the end, like, thank God law school is over, OK? Uh, and that's especially true for you graduates, because it's not just law school that's over. It's school that's over, uh, or at least your parents hope so. Uh, there won't be any medical degree in your future. Uh, but as you return your cap and gown and say your tearful goodbyes to the friends you've made here and promise to stay in touch, which I hope you do, it will indeed hit you that this is a beginning. It's the beginning of the rest of your so-called life, uh, and in particular, your career as a lawyer. And it's that part I want to focus on today. So let's face it. There hasn't been a lot of good news about the legal profession lately, okay? There's been a lot of doom and gloom. The press is full of stories about shrinking job markets and some even projecting that robot lawyers are going to replace you. Uh, I have a friend named Richard Susskind wrote a very charming book called The End of Lawyers. Uh, he always reminds me there's a question mark at the end, so maybe there's future for you. Uh, and look. Uh, as the dean generously said, I've spent my career studying you and the careers of others like you, and there's no doubt this is a challenging time for the legal profession. It's a time of transition, and that transition is being pushed by things that are pushing our world generally. Globalization of economic activity, the rise and the speed of sophist and sophistication of information technology. You guys are born digital, as a colleague of mine once wrote. Or the way in which different parts of the world are moving closer and closer together. Well, these things are transforming the whole world. Why in the world wouldn't they transform us? Law, after all, is a lagging, not a leading indicator of change, for those of you who studied economics. We follow broader trends in society, in culture, uh, in the world. As the graduates know, in a common law world, you cannot say anything new unless you definitively prove someone said it before. That's called precedent. So there's a reason why we tend to follow what else is happening in the world. But it's precisely because of these broader trends that I believe the world needs the class of 2018 more than ever. After all, all you need to do is look around and look at how complicated our world is and how central law and lawyers are to understanding and resolving this complexity. You know, listen, the dean said I graduated in 1980. Thank you very much for telling me that I'm older than all their parents, too. Um, but listen, there are whole new fields of law that basically didn't exist when I was a law student. You know, take the field of human rights as a field, or internet law, or alternative dispute resolution, or all sorts of healthcare law fields. And there are many other that are being remade as we speak from, by these big trends of globalization and uh, information technology that we talked about. Take family law, privacy law, how about that one? Commercial transactions. All of this has created enormous opportunities and new careers for you. Careers that will cross traditional boundaries of law, technology, science, business, politics, philanthropy, medicine, and even, yes, Mr. President, philosophy. Uh, and they'll be here not just in the United States, but around the world. And as graduates of WNL, you are uniquely positioned to take advantage of these opportunities. Every first year student here, all of you, took courses in American public law process, transnational law, and in my view, most importantly, professional responsibility, as the dean said in his wonderful remarks. Many courses don't teach courses like this at all, or they, if they teach them, they don't teach it in the first year. And all of you, perhaps even more importantly, have had the benefit of 
WNL's incredible experiential learning curriculum. One is really the envy of any law school in the world. Participating in a vast array of clinics and externships and simulated learning courses in your second and third year. And all of you have had the benefit of attending a school with deep connections to the bench and bar. As the uh, President Dudley said, seven ABA presidents have been graduates of this school, including the association's current president, Linda Klein. All of this will help you bring uh, and, and make successful and satisfying careers in the law, careers that will undoubtedly span many jobs. So one of my research projects is something called the After the JD Study. We're following 4,000 lawyers who entered the legal profession in the year 2000. Uh, we surveyed them three times, once when they were kind of brand new lawyers, then they were mid-career, and then they were uh, after about 12 years. And one of the more surprising findings is that those graduates who had been in the uh, profession maybe 12 years had had on average almost four jobs. Think about that. You know, as you think about whatever your current job is, most likely it's not going to be the job that you're going to have even for a very long time, let alone for the rest of your career, and your generation will undoubtedly be even more mobile. Which means, to flourish in this new environment, this may be the end of your formal education. But one sense it is a commencement, it better be the commencement of your life as a lifelong learner. And if you take the kind of curiosity about the world that you learned here at WNL, I have no doubt that you will continue to learn what you need to do to build brilliant careers in the law. But the most important thing you need to take from here uh, are your values. And the value that I believe you're going to need most in the world you're going to come to live in is openness and the ability to reach across difference. I don't have to tell anyone here that we're living in a very fractious time. And I don't care what side of the political aisle you are on, no one can be happy with the way our politics and indeed our society has become increasingly polarized into warring camps with little understanding or appreciation of the hopes and dreams or fears and concerns of their fellow citizens. Now, tragically, as WL knows more than any other university, we've seen what can happen, the catastrophic consequences when deep divisions are allowed to fester and grow unattended. It's therefore incumbent on each of us to do our part to reach across our divisions, to build bonds of community and trust with all Americans. And lawyers have a special responsibility as both professionals and as citizens. As professionals, lawyers have been given a special responsibility for the laws and institutions that our founding fathers believed would hold this country together. But lawyers are also citizens who often assume important leadership roles throughout society, including, of course, as elected and appointed officials, often at the very highest levels of our government. Given these important positions of trust, it is especially critical that lawyers in their professional work, leadership roles, and even in their private lives work to pre preserve and extend the legal framework and fundamental rights that are so essential to our constitutional democracy. Once again, your time here at WNL has uniquely prepared you to play this important role. The very name of this august institution underscores both its complex history and its unique perspective on finding ways to work through difference. As you know, Washington and Lee is named for two leading figures in American history. George Washington, who led the army that established the United States as a sovereign nation, and Robert E. Lee, who led the army that attempted to sever the Confederate States from this union. At one level, there would seem to be no deeper division than this. And yet, from these seemingly intractable opposites has grown a university and a law school that, as the dean read in the mission statement, uh, is committed to cultivate broad-minded, highly skilled, and honorable practitioners of law 
within a diverse and collaborative intellectual community exemplifying rigor, trust, and civility. One could see this legacy through the complex history of this institution. In 1796, George Washington gave a gift to the university so generous that it still pays part of the cost of the education of every student, including the approximately 18% of the law school student body who came from racial and ethnic groups and the 50% of the student body who were women that were not recognized as full citizens of the country where George Washington was then serving as the nation's first president. As the brilliant musical Hamilton, which has probably done more than any other recent cultural event to allow all Americans to embrace the complexity and contradictory, but in the end triumphant legacy of our founding fathers, it truly is nice to have Washington on your side. And you guys know this. But Robert E. Lee's legacy is here. One of Lee's first acts in assuming the presidency of the university in 1865 after his surrender at Appomattox was to reach out to Judge John W. Brokenbaugh to make the Lexington Law School he had started uh, to be part of what was then called Washington College. In the remaining decades of the 19th century, this new law school would go on to graduate many, many distinguished lawyers including one whose impact on the legal profession and indeed on the country in the 20th century exemplifies the important but also complex legacy of the two founders of this institution. John W. Davis, class of 1980, sorry, 1895, would go on to become one of the most important lawyers of his day or frankly any day. Over his six-decade career, Davis was served as U.S. Ambassador to the United Kingdom, Solicitor General of the United States, a member of the United States House of Representatives, and in 1924, the Democratic Party's candidate for President of the United States. But Davis' was most lasting legacy is, one, is being one of the most successful Supreme Court advocates in history. Davis argued over 140 cases before the Supreme Court, the second most by any lawyer in history. And among these were many impressive victories. At the top of the list is a case you guys probably studied called Youngstown Sheeted Tube Company versus Sawyer, decided in 1952, in which Mr. Davis persuaded the court that President Truman had violated the Constitution when he seized the nation's steel plants to prevent a strike that the president believed would cripple the nation's fighting readiness during the Korean War. In successfully arguing that not even the president of the United States is above the Constitution, John W. Davis established a precedent that is still vital to our democracy. But ironically, it was an argument that, David, that Davis lost in the Supreme Court two years later that would ultimately ensure that the Constitution guarantees the equality of all citizens before the law. In 1954, John W. Davis was the lawyer for one of the five school boards defending the doctrine of separate but equal in Brown v. Board of Education. Fortunately for our country's future, this time the Supreme Court unanimously rejected Mr. Davis's argument and thereby rescued the promise of equality and due process of law enshrined in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution adopted at the year following the Civil War from the continuing legacy of slavery and discrimination. As the graduates undoubtedly know, Mr. Davis's opponent in Brown was Thurgood Marshall who in his illustrious career as a lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and as Solicitor General of the United States, also was one of the most successful advocates in the history of the Supreme Court. But what most people don't know is that one of Thurgood Marshall's models of great advocacy before the Supreme Court was John W. Davis. As Marshall's biographer Juan Williams recounts, when he was a student at Howard Law School, where he learned from the brilliant Charles Hamilton Houston how to build the step-by-step -step litigation campaign that ultimately culminated in Brown. Marshall would skip class to go watch Davis argue cases before the Supreme Court, dazzled by Davis's brilliance and eloquence. As is clear from a famous set of photographs taken before the oral arguments in Brown, notwithstanding representing diametrically opposing positions in one of the most important cases in the court's history, these two legendary advocates were able to see beyond their disagreements to recognize their shared professional excellence. 
Indeed, this shared sense of professionalism can be seen in the way that the two men arrived at their respective positions at the council table in Brown. Once again, at first blush, their careers uh, to this historic moment could not seem more different. Marshall had spent virtually his entire career as a civil rights lawyer, representing poor black individuals who otherwise had no access to the law. Davis, on the other hand, was the founder of the great Wall Street law firm of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell, where he spent his career in private practice representing some of the country's wealthiest and most powerful organizations, organizations with the ability not just to access law, but indeed the ability to shape the entire legal system. But in Brown, Davis' client was not a powerful corporation. It was a local school board. And rather than charging the kind of handsome fee that he undoubtedly received from his typical corporate client, Davis, like Marshall, agreed to represent the school board pro bono publico, donating his service to the board, quote, for the public good. Now, the fact that Mr. Davis believed that defending racial segregation in public schools was for the public good sadly speaks volumes about the mores of the day among Wall Street lawyers. At the time, Brown was argued, there were virtually no minorities or women working in any of the established Wall Street law firms, and only a handful accepted Jewish lawyers or Catholic lawyers. But thanks in no small part to the revolution in consciousness that Davis's defeat in Brown engendered, today the great law firm of Davis Polk that bears his name is one of the leaders in providing pro bono legal services, including pro bono legal services to the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, which was Thurgood Marshall's uh, alma mater. And this service is provided by Davis Polk lawyers who are themselves increasingly diverse, although nowhere near as diverse as the profession should be more than six decades from Brown. Women now constitute as more than 50% of all the law students, with students from traditionally underrepresented groups constituting close to 20% of law school graduates, including here at Washington and Lee. And when one takes account of the other forms of the diversity that were not even on our agenda uh, at the time Down Brown was decided, sexual orientation, disability, social class, the important, albeit still imperfect, progress we have made on bringing the promise of Brown to the legal profession itself is even more imperative. This, too, is due in no small measure to this law school. Forty years ago next month, the Supreme Court issued another landmark decision in another case involving race and education entitled Regents of the University of California versus Bakke. The pivotal opinion in Bakke, as the graduates will also undoubtedly know, was written by Justice Lewis F. Powell. Justice, Powell opinions, Justice Powell's opinion upholding the use of race as one of many factors in admission is widely credited with preserving the slow but important progress of integrating America's great universities and professional schools, including at Justice Powell's alma mater, the Washington and Lee School of Law. The fact that George Washington Neither George Washington nor Robert E. Lee could have foreseen this result, or perhaps even would have approved of it, is just one more way that the great ideals of freedom and equality upon which this country and this university was founded can and must evolve beyond the limitations of the historical circumstances in which they were conceived. We can and should continue to debate precisely how these historical circumstances should be remembered. But we should never forget that it is the very right to have these debates that is the genius of the system that our founding fathers created. And as lawyers, we should never fail to take pride in the fact that the primary mechanism for preserving these freedoms is the law, just as we should never shrink from our duty as lawyers to ensure that the legal system that protects these precious liberties is open and fair to all. There is no better place to speak about these vital matters than in a law school, and no better time than in the moment in which a new group of lawyers are about to commence their careers as professionals and as citizens. And at a time when it is hard for many Americans to see beyond our current divisions, there can be no better law school commencement ceremony to address new lawyers than here at Washington and Lee. Since the university changed its name to reflect the role that both Washington and Lee played in its founding, 
This law school has worked hard to navigate the divisions implicit in this dual legacy to create an institution of excellence and equality, one that can be proud to have graduated outstanding lawyers from every background. Lawyers like Robert J. Gray, Jr., class of 1976. Lawyers who have not only become leaders of the profession, in Gray's case, becoming the only the second African American to serve as ABA president, but also to lead the charge to bring equality to the legal profession, in Gray's case, as the president of the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity. Lawyers like those in the class of 2018, who I am certain will leave the profession of law to quote John W. Davis's eloquent words, a quote, better instrument of human justice than they found it. You know, the president said, the motto of this great university is non incautious fortui. You can see it's been a long time since I had Latin. Not unmindful of the future. At first, I thought this maxim was too modest for a university with such a long and distinguished past. But then I realized that it is precisely because of this rich history that it is critical that those who matriculated Washington and Lee remember that its past must always be put in service of a future that those for whom this great institution is named could never have fully imagined. So as you go from this beautiful cloister to commence your lives as lawyers and as citizens, always remember to be mindful that every day you have the opportunity to be a better instrument of human justice than you were the day before. Just as I am now mindful that I'm standing between you and beginning this glorious future. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you. I promise you that in my future days, I will always be mindful of the privilege of having been allowed to be here on this joyous day of your commencement. Thank you and good luck. I'd now like to call on Jonathan Murphy and Kelly Chrisman, uh, President and Vice President of the third year class who will present a gift uh, to our speaker. Well, Professor Wilkins, we thank you for joining us as we celebrate this new beginning. Uh, I gave the full history of the walking stick yesterday, so I won't go into all of it, but it's about a 100-year tradition uh, distinguishing the third-year law students on the Washington and Lee University campus. While we don't carry them around with us, if you go into nearly any uh, WNL Law alum's office today, you'll find them there. So we want to thank you for being with us today, um, and we wish you well in the best rest of your career. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a 17-year-old. I know how to put this to good use. <laughs> All right, before I yield the program back to President Dudley to conclude our ceremony, there are a few people who will be retiring from Washington Lee Law School this year that I'd like to recognize. We actually have several, so um, after I acknowledge them, I'll ask that you join me in a round of applause. And I'll go by um, seniority in terms of service. Uh, Linda Newell, senior library assistant, who joined the law school staff in 1974. Professor Mark Grunewald, who joined the faculty in 1976. Macy Coffey, administrative assistant who joined the law school in 1985. Jackie Sandage, lead custodian and facilities management who helped keep Lewis Hall in pristine condition who joined Washington and Lee in 1986. Arthur Perry, media specialist in law technology, joined the law school in 1990. Joan Casper, administrative assistant who joined the law, law library staff in 1996. And Bonnie Gates, library assistant who joined the law library staff in 2003. Please join me in, in recognizing these. <laughs> and with that, I'll yield the program back to President Dudley. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilkins, for that 
fine and inspiring address. I'd like to bring these exercises to their fitting conclusion by expressing our gratitude to all those who've made this day possible. On behalf of the graduates, we thank the faculty whose scholarship and dedication to teaching have prepared you to be begin your careers. We thank the alumni and friends of WNL whose generosity has supported you during your time here, often in ways that you may not have realized. We thank the university staff, administrators, custodians, dining service, and facilities employees whose daily performance of their duties has made your lives more comfortable. And we thank your families whose sacrifices have made it possible for you to be here. You've chosen a profession, as you heard from Professor Wilkins, that will afford you the opportunity to do much good. I know you will take advantage of that opportunity, make yourselves proud, make your families proud, make WNL proud. Come back often to visit us in Lexington. You will be warmly welcome. We will be eager to hear how your lives and your careers unfold. One quick housekeeping note due to the weather, we are going to move the lunch from Cannon Green to Evans Hall, right across Washington Avenue. I wish you the very best, and this concludes the commencement ceremony. We are adjourned. Thank you. Bye.